Hi everyone, welcome to the first in the Menzies Cyber Law series. Thank you everybody for registering and for joining this evening. It's a beautiful Thursday evening in Canberra. Wherever you are, you're very welcome. My name is Dr. Pip Ryan. I'm an associate professor here in the College of Law at the Australian National University. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this series. Before I introduce our speakers for this evening, I would like to acknowledge the land that we are on um, in relation to the university, the Australian National University. Um, I acknowledge that this land has been occupied for tens of thousands of years, and it is something that has been occupied prior to the arrival of Europeans. I pay my respects and honour all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, as well as their elders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge the stories, song lines, traditions and living cultures of all First Nations people here in Australia and abroad. So with that said, and with that welcome, thank you very much, particularly to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Islanders who are with us now. Um, you're very welcome and thank you very much for sharing this amazing land with us. Um, it's my very great pleasure to just facilitate this evening. And in doing so, I will start by, first of all, introducing Liz Gillies from the Menzies Foundation. I will then invite a presentation from Sarah Steele at Cambridge University. We then have a pre-recorded interview between me and the delightful Bill Boothby. And finally, we will finish with Will Bateman, who will be live and with us to the end of this session. And if we have time before 7 p.m., we will entertain some discussion and perhaps answer any questions that come into the chat. They're very welcome. Now, just to explain one more thing, we have deliberately curtailed the Q&A and discussion because tomorrow morning, everybody who's attending this is going to receive an emailed invitation to a special series that begins next Thursday called Menzies Cyber Masters. And the first one next Thursday is based on this evening's event. It is a one-off, one-hour free online discussion for everybody who's joined us this evening and we will look forward to welcoming everyone. So to move on to the formal part of this evening's event, I am really honored to introduce Liz Gillies, the CEO of the Menzies Foundation the Menzies Foundation has been very generous in supporting this series, and I have to say Liz has been particularly instrumental and creative in shaping this event. So Liz, over to you. Thank you, Pip, so much. I'm so delighted to be joining this community tonight. I would like to really acknowledge Pip and Sally Wheeler for the really fabulous job that they've done in pulling this series together. The Menzies Foundation, um, aspires to raise the profile and importance of outstanding leadership. We do that by identifying leadership challenges and creating boundary spanning opportunities to consider those challenges in new contexts. And this series um, of discussions and conversations and seminars with the ANU College of Law is to really look at the relationship between cyber and the law to more deeply understand the sorts of computational, strategic and behavioural skills that lawyers most likely are going to have to become highly competent in in order to address the suite of challenging legal cyber questions that are emergent at the moment and likely to be accelerated as we move into a more cyber-centric world. So Pip, um, the Menzies Foundation is really thrilled to be partnering. We commend the College of Law and you particularly for the really wonderful work you've done in putting this together. And we look very much forward to sharing this journey with you as we engage with these marvellous speakers who you have gathered together tonight. So thank you very much on behalf of the Menzies Foundation. Thank you, Liz. That's very generous and really appreciated. And I will just add that one of the things that the Menzies Foundation and ANU has collaborated on is the creation of a series of micro-credentials, and we will also be providing information about those. These are short courses. They're very punchy. Think boot camp but highly scholarly. And I'm incredibly proud to say that our own Dr. Will Bateman is also going to be participating in delivering micro-credentials under this umbrella. And it's a, a real pleasure to be able to actually design these kinds of courses that reach out to executives and professionals. 
Okay, so um, Sarah Steele, you are a trooper. Thank you so much for being with us, having to get up a little bit early in the morning in Cambridge. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Sarah, particularly as Sarah is also one of our ANU LLM conveners. She convenes a couple of really popular courses. I don't quite know how she manages to just roll out this incredible scholarship and content. Sarah is the direct Deputy Director of the Intellectual Forum at Jesus College at Cambridge University. She's also a Senior Research Associate focusing on themes and problems of interest to communities across the world at the interface of public law, health, and a, she's a Senior Research Associate at the Clinical School in Public Health. Sarah's academic interests include human trafficking, migration and health, public law, health, sorry, public health law, uh, public health criminology, social media and professionalism. And what she's going to speak to tonight is the intersection of some of these particular interests and cyber law. Sarah, we're in your capable hands. Thanks so much for that introduction, Pip. And I have to apologize to everybody here for the apparent croakiness that I have. I am currently in the UK and I have been a little bit ill. Um, so if you could bear with me at any point and if I lose my voice, I am so sorry in advance. Absolutely happy to talk to anybody about some of the issues I raise, especially if for any reason the understanding of me falters. So I apologize. But I'm so pleased to be with you here for this Menzies Cyber Law series. And I, I do want to thank Pip and Liz for all the work that they've done so far. Um, and it's seemingly a really odd place for me to be as somebody who is focused so much on health is actually somebody who's trained in law but lives in a clinical school these days. Why, why am I here? What is going on? And that's really what I'm going to talk to you about today is about how these interfaces are coming together. It is a seemingly odd place for a global health specialist to show up in normal times, but in 2020, 2021, certainly the pandemic ushered us into a new period, a period where social distancing and self-isolation as an Australian living in the UK, I'm keenly aware it's a period of travel limitations and restrictions where it's not so easy to move anymore. We've got a period of intensified reliance on um, platforms like Zoom, like we're on now to communicate. But most importantly, and what I'm really gonna dig down on today is that we have moved into a period where mobile apps and other interventions that are being used by public health specialists um, to flag for us exposure, to alert us to risks, have become part of many of our worlds. So for while this digital technology for many of us has been enabling, it's allowed us to keep track, it's allowed us to keep working, it's allowed people like me stuck abroad to talk to my parents back in Australia, to talk to my family and those things. It's certainly been enabling. And I wanna to nod to that, even though a lot of what I'm gonna say is about exposing caution and issues. I acknowledge that these things have been tools that have been enabling as much as they have been limiting. Um, but in talking about the limits, I want to today explore how some of the movements around cyber surveillance and some of the movements around what we've been doing during the pandemic under the hat of public health interventions have in fact led us to the exacerbation of existing inequalities. They've amplified existing controversies and they've raised some real issues for future humans that we have to confront. And we need to confront right now and we need to think, collect data and explore over the near future. And that's really what I want to explore today. So what I want to do is just kind of work you through how I perceive what's happened over the last 18 months, talking through some of the problems and issues, legally speaking, and then conclude on the questions that I really think remain that we need to confront. Certainly, the far reaching consequences of the pandemic have seen public health restated as a security issue, as specifically a safety and national security issue and as a legal issue globally. I want to nod to the fact that this isn't necessarily new. I think it's so easy to see this as a state of exception. Um, but public health interventions and quarantine using the force of the law, using governance mechanisms to respond to this, quite frankly, are old hat. 
we've done this for millennia. We've, we've limited our borders, we've shut ourselves off and we've used various things to address this. Certainly over recent centuries, much of global health law has been concerned with health security and quarantine measures to stop communicable disease. This is not new. What it is, is new to us. And what the big augmentation of this has been, has been the digital age. Certainly the re-securitization of public health, the move towards using security languages is something that had started to evolve, but really was pushed forward by this pandemic. We'd moved to talk about things we call in public health, the social determinants of health. We'd moved to a whole health perspective since the kind of 1980s, 1990s. We saw health as a human rights issue. We moved to change our language, but we've seen kind of a stark, re a snap around and move back to talk about security. And I think it's important to not think that's new but that it is a return to a previous language and talking about health security is absolutely important because as I see it and as I will step us through, we are crossing privacy lines that until recently we thought were unacceptable in liberal democracies. And it's important that we don't just rush forward in a state of emergency without consideration. And that consideration is multiple strands of consideration from the efficacy and legitimacy of the public health interventions themselves through to consideration of our human rights and considerations of what we think is acceptable for the future of global health law to do. And I'm gonna step through each of those. So to begin with what's happened, to mitigate the spread of COVID-19, governments around the world, right, around the globe have introduced emergency measures that constrain individual freedoms, freedom of movement, they've constrained social and economic rights, and in my opinion, we have eroded global solidarity. Um, the fact that we immediately here in the UK um, stopped export of essential medicines, that um, there have been cessation of exportation of um, PPE and things like that. This has eroded a global lens. We have moved from global solidarity to a period of concerted nationalism in some places. I'm not saying this is absolutely universal, but being based in the UK as an Australian, I've certainly observed this and it's something we've observed of Australia. It's very hard for people like me to get home at all at the moment. So what I see is a erosion of that movement towards global solidarity. Certainly regulatory measures have done things like closed schools, workplaces, <coughs> sorry, transportation systems. We've seen closure of public spaces, um, gatherings. There was red tape around the playground near me for an extended period where my child couldn't play. These things have happened. We've also introduced things like mandatory home confinement. We've introduced large scale um, hotel and other forms of confinement and quarantine. And what's really critical for us today is that we've employed a large scale electronic surveillance to automate or semi-automate much of that, those processes. Electronic tools to combat the pandemic have become a common feature, both locally and also nationally. And now we're seeing as people start to travel more again, internationally. These include tools that integrate public health and private telecommunications databases. They see governments using geolocation um, from so smartphones and other um, electronic devices. And we see the use of things like smartphones to peremptory trace whole population interactions or to enforce quarantine compliance. So we're seeing all these different facets go on. I also want to nod to the fact that we're using facial recognition and fever screening technologies, which capture facial imagery um, and then use data points to measure whether you're unwell, to recognize if you're moving and who you've interacted with. We are using a host of different technologies that capture images of people, that capture where they're moving, who they're interacting with, and we have varying protections around that data. Here, where I'm based in the UK, we use a semi-automated system. So we have put an app onto our phones 
that gathers data about who we've come near to, but it also involves us scanning a QR code to be allowed into a pub. So every time I want to go and eat somewhere or have a pint, I scan a QR code and I have to scan it with the people I'm with. That automatically gives information not only on where I get my pint, but who I'm drinking my pint with and when I'm drinking it. That isn't optional. I can't get the pint. I can't go into the pub without scanning the app. So while my consent is there that I have consented to download that app, I've agreed to its terms and conditions around my privacy. I can't go into a store. I can't go into a pub. I can't interact with my friends in any public space without scanning many of those QR codes. And so what I want to do is challenge some of the views around this to explore some of its limitations for the most vulnerable in society and explore what questions that raises for us. And while I'd like to point out that getting my pint is contingent on a QR code in England now, all the jokes aside, it is something where governments are now through the pandemic response routinely gathering significant amounts more data about me than they perhaps were in the past. And also so are private companies who have expanded their data capture under the guise of the pandemic even more than they were before. Absolutely my online shopping app knew lots about me and could tell me when I was pregnant that I was pregnant before I was I even knew I was pregnant, those sorts of things. But what's very aware of now is that we are putting that under the hat of global health. We're putting that under the justification that we're not doing it to market you. We're not doing it to do these things, to, to do those, those sort of commercial things. We're saying this is about public safety. We're saying this is for the good of the public. And I really want us to explore and challenge that. People are handing over more and more information under the guise of a public health intervention. And we need to ask some questions there. As I've alluded to, much of that public health response has been put under the guise of being an extraordinary measure. It has been put under the guise of emergency. We have been told, and, and quite openly here in the UK, the rhetoric has been used that we must not dally, we not, must not debate. If we do not act quickly, we undermine effectively responding to this pandemic. These extraordinary sacrifices, and that is the words that have been used by many governments, um, must be swiftly made to protect the public, to keep granny alive. Me checking in, me giving you all this data is necessary to protect our grandparents, to protect those who are ill and vulnerable in society. And these extraordinary measures are both necessary and critical for us to keep us well, and to keep our loved ones safe. Now that is a really enticing, easy rhetoric to absorb and become compelled by. It gives us that sense of national identity. It gives us that sense we are acting for the greater good. And it makes us think that in this crisis moment, this moment of exception, it's a moment we're willing to suspend those protections of the things we usually hold so dear. Our liberty, our privacy, those sorts of things. But what I'm most concerned about is not that we want to do something for the good. In fact, I'm really happy as humanity, we are able to appeal to those things for the greater good. What I want us to not do is suspend the ordinary scrutiny we as lawyers and those in government participate in, in democracies like Australia and the UK, where I happen to live, which reverberated through our societies for many years to protect us. But what I want to point out here is that many of these extraordinary measures are not debated as rigorously as perhaps we would do in ordinary times. And often, as we've observed in the past, these measures, supposedly for our security, often last longer than they were supposed to. Many of the things that were put into place during the September 11th terrorism securitization process are still in place today. And so it is with that view that I want to say that we need to consider the fundamental notion that COVID is exceptional, that it is a crisis, that it is something truly extraordinary. Governments have responded with that language of exception and legislation has taken emergency measures. 
but I'm left asking as a global health specialist, not as a lawyer, but as a global health specialist, whether really COVID is exceptional in any way, shape or form. We have certainly had pandemics across history. We've had new diseases, new viruses emerge, kill huge swathes of the population. Absolutely, we should act, but we should do so with a long-term view. We should not respond in knee-jerk emergency mode. We should know these pandemics come. In fact, since I'd studied public health, over a decade ago, for the first time I looked at global health when I was in Australia in 2005, people told me pandemics were coming. Every single clinical um, public health specialist said pandemics, they're, in, they're inevitable, and Ebola came. And we responded as if it was an emergency. And those are the sorts of things that the international health regulations, these international responses have tried to address albeit as we've seen in a flawed way that needs to be constantly revisited, refined and responded to. But in terms of surveillance, so much of what we've had around the pandemic has suggested that the pandemic has ruptured the social fabric, it's accelerated and exacerbated existing issues and that technology offers a solution. Technology is the cure to some of the problems of social isolation and things like that. Jump on Zoom, have a wine night, those kind of things. And it has jumped on the fact that we can leverage technology as an intervention in public health um, to keep us healthy. That to me has accelerated and exacerbated existing issues around cyber surveillance. Certainly at the societal level, the pandemic has intensified issues around state suppression of online information. It's intensified um, the need to address disinformation and misinformation on online platforms, especially around things like vaccines. Um, it has intensified our need to consider data collection for undefined or non-explicit purposes under the guise of things like contact tracing. And it also has um, intensified our need to look at cyber attack operations which threaten effective healthcare delivery. Those are just a few of the issues that I, I can see here. But it has also raised issues around equity, as specifically health equity. The digital divide between those with reliable internet access and those who lack any meaningful access to the internet has become increasingly obvious, certainly in places like Argentina, where contact tracing apps on smartphones left those in um, precarious settlement areas without any access to that, that safety mechanism supposedly given by contact tracing um, because they simply didn't have a smartphone to alert them, to trace their contacts, all of those things. And yet these were some of the most vulnerable people to COVID uh, um, and negative COVID outcomes if they did become ill. I think also it's raised the issue of the dominance of private technology companies and the opacity of their relationships with government. And that's certainly become a more prominent issue in light of some of the controversies around contracts and agreements with these companies to deliver some of the contact tracing under tender arrangements. So really, I want to unpick some of those things I've just said. I want to reflect on an important aspect of the public health response um, specifically where countries have leveraged the extensive data and geolocation capture of motor, mobile phones um, to look at travel patterns, to look at interactions and those sorts of things. Certainly some countries have pursued using apps that collect that data in an automated fashion that then set alerts to people and in doing so report the location of those interactions via text message to all people's contracts. So I'm sure some of you have heard about cases across Asia. Um, I'm gonna not be specific in case I reveal personal data about people, but cases where a gentleman attended a massage parlor and his whole family were alerted about his interaction with sex workers through sending an automated alert of COVID exposure. These sorts of things have happened during the pandemic. In other countries, um, there's been people exposed to stigma. It's revealed people's sexuality by looking at their interactions and the spaces they go to. Those sorts of things have happened. Geolocation apps on mobile phones and wearables. I, I, I wear one, but 
my little Fitbit tells you everywhere I'm going and what I've been if I track a run and those sorts of things. They generate huge amounts of data on us. They can tell you so much about our movement around cities and rural spaces, all of those things. Others have been put on people for very specified, more limited purposes. And I, I wanna be careful to say that some countries have used wearables in order to track compliance with 10 or 14 day isolation mechanisms, which have allowed those people reduced expenditure and greater access to travel for those who couldn't afford things like hotel quarantining. So I think it's fair to say now in 2021, more than 2019, location surveillance techniques are now the norm. Um, tracking people's movements, identifying with whom they've interacted is now a thing. It's done. And according to the discourse, importantly, it's done to protect us. It's done to assure our health. But that is replete with issues, specifically for future humans. What we have to remember is that the requirements of international law and human rights law are supposed to make sure that um, things are done that are necessary, so in line with proper scientific and public health evidence, that they are proportionate, that is that they're proportionate to the public health threat and they are time limited, and that they are not arbitrary that they're non-discriminatory. And that's drawing from the 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And I've alluded to why I think we're falling down on some of those things with our current unreflective approach to cyber surveillance as a mechanism of public health intervention. First of all, technological solutions are exacerbating the digital divide. They are there are people that are remaining outside of monitoring, as I've alluded to, those in informal settlements without access to smartphones. Quite notably, those who live in those informal settlements are at high risk, as I mentioned to COVID. But there's also those who are outside of these mechanisms by their own choice, those who choose not to have smartphones. So it's not just the elderly and vulnerable that don't use these things that we so often refer to. There are people who are inherently suspicious and probably rightfully so, of having their behavior tracked. Those with irregular migration status. Those who have an experience of discrimination on the basis of their sexuality, their religion, those sorts of things. Those who engage in activities that are stigmatized or still remain illegal in their settings. They may opt to avoid these accessing these things. They may actually have ditched their mobile phone as the compulsion to use these things happens. Um, here in the UK, those who are travellers so often relied on these but are so lacking in confidence to track their behaviours that they just leave their phone at home um, in some of the communities I've interviewed because of suspicion. Those are obviously who are in extreme global poverty may not have access to, but there are many who choose not to have these phones, which removes them from interventions. That biases the data we receive. It biases the a measure of efficacy of interventions around these populations, it means we lack evidence on how to respond to those people. But it's also important to remember that many of the actual apps are themselves subject to bias, not just at the level of output of data, but also at the input and design stage. For example, many of the data sets and surveillance systems that are put in place do coincidentally or accidentally target vulnerable and marginalized groups. The way that data is captured can expose them to particular and peculiar risk. Um, the example I've given so far is in countries where homosexuality remains a criminal activity, it may expose individuals to harm and death if the way that data is captured is captured in a way that gives governments and um, law enforcement access to information on them. But I also just want to say that there has also been the matter of risk of slippage um, of this kind of thing where we say what we're doing is one thing. We are tracing contact tracing for public health. And in fact, what we use this for is policing and national security. That happened in Minnesota in the USA where contact tracing applications were used to support um, the tracking of Black Lives Matter protesters. Um, we saw direct use of this surveillance technology to support cases and arrests. Um, and that really concerns me, using something supposedly to protect your health, to tell you about exposure to a virus, 
to then track a minority community expressing and challenging the wrongful policing of their community uh, under an oppressive policing regime in that place. It's a serious cause for concern. I cannot underplay what that means for future humans. Absolutely, some are willing to defend this surveillance on the basis that it protects us but are we content that it is used for law enforcement in that setting? I absolutely am not. Um, and certainly interest groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, Privacy International have all questioned this geolocation surveillance system, but they challenged it ideologically. And I also wanna challenge it on the basis of what we know. I wanna ask as a public health person, what do the data say? Do these contact tracing things even work? And the answer is we don't really know. I was looking in the lead up to this to, to some definitive kind of studies, some systematic reviews, some kind of gold standard um, trials, those kind of things. And there's some small scale stuff, but it does not tell us if me fobbing that QR code in a pub delivers on giving me information that gets me to test and then finds out if I've had COVID. And part of that is in itself the privacy protections we've put in place. It does not connect my check-in to my actual COVID testing if I've been exposed to the outcome of that test. So in many respects, we have this kind of perverse system where to protect me and my data, we can't measure if this even works. We don't know. And that for me leads to some real questions and concerns. As I've mentioned, history certainly gives us pause about emergency surveillance mechanisms. And the Minnesota case gives us real cause for concern that this may easily be redeployed for other purposes that we may not be as comfortable with. For some of us, the answer simply lies in leveraging human rights law. It lies in making sure things are ne uh, a necessary, proportionate and not arbitrary. However, the public health specialist in me wants us to be a bit more evidence-based than just saying law will protect us. I meet so few global health lawyers that have public health training and legal training. And one thing I wanna say that's absolutely great about this program and great about this event and great about ANU is that it has been able to present us with opportunities for legal education that aren't just limited to lawyers. So getting public health specialists to learn law is really critical so they understand these issues and how they can feed into the evidence space to appraise the appropriateness and to enter into the ethical and philosophical debates at a different level. But I think it's also important for lawyers to increasingly get public health and global health training. Absolutely, we must work together. Lawyers need to increasingly understand the evidential base. They need to understand correlation and causation in not just the legal understandings of the word causation. We must be able to establish why an alternative less intrusive mechanism or measure may be both adequate or we may decide it's inadequate. To evaluate and monitor safeguards put in place, we must make sure they don't undermine the intervention itself. To do so, we need lawyers who understand epidemiology and statistics, health protection, health systems theory, those sorts of things, as much as we need public health specialist to understand human rights law, international law, intellectual property law, and all these things. The question therefore becomes about how we can do that, how we can bring these expertise together. We've had the rapid proliferation of surveillance mechanisms set up by many governments around the world at the hands in many cases of a private elite. And we must consider whether the response to that should be done by international bodies like the WHO, who inevitably are going to have to revisit things like the international health regulations and could consider surveillance and big data, AI, those kind of issues within the bounds of future pandemic response um, treaties and um, different kinds of responses there. Um, we also need to ask if what we do at the national level is appropriate. Surveillance is certainly an easier policy lever than doing a more robust building of healthcare systems. 
to address the social determinants of health requires us to do things that have a longer view, that are legally and legislatively harder at the policy level, but also involve us being able to press the levers of government to ensure health both at a domestic level and worldwide. And almost certainly we need to understand more that AI, big data are health issues and part of a feature of future discourses of health rights. I would emphasize these aren't just national issues, these are international issues. We have an obligation under the International Covenant on Social, Economic and Cultural Rights to work together to deliver on health. In short, and in summary, the normalization of intrusive cyber surveillance tools deployed by government in addressing the pandemic demands our attention, and, but we shouldn't let it distract us. Future humans need to think about two critical questions, in my opinion. One, how can we better prepare the international community for communicable and non-communicable diseases? Building robust local, national and international responses, including legal responses that avert the need for intrusive emergency mechanisms. And two, is intrusive cyber surveillance something we are willing to accept in order to meet global health ends? I certainly can't answer these questions myself right now, but I hope that you can join us in exploring these either in something like these professional series or an LLM, but also in future discussions, which are inevitable in, at government levels amongst private companies at, and around the world. And with that, I kind of want to leave you with those questions. How can we build a healthier world and how can we use these levers to do so, so we don't need emergency mechanisms? And where does cyber security belong and cyber surveillance belong within that? Yeah, good question, Sarah. Thank you. And, and just with a call to action and a really explicit framework underlying those questions. And I was thinking while you were expressing those at the end, how interesting it is that you could ask similar questions in other domains. You know, even outside global health, we could be asking ourselves these questions. And part of the whole design of the LLM here at ANU is intended, of course, to ensure that it's not just people with law degrees, but other cognate and including science degrees who come in and who in a, in a class, like in a discussion context, and also with the micro credentials, the idea is that we can then have these discussions across these disciplines, because lawyers are going to have to think about risk in a whole new way, risk and compliance, but then also understand context of risk, appetite for risk. I loved, I've got to say, I loved some of the language that you used, you know, talking about we've, we've sacrificed our privacy and the question is, will we ever get it back? Um, and then you also talked about erosion of global solidarity. I thought that was really insightful and it is true. There's a real nationalism about this, this lens through which we're regarding this that's almost been imposed on us. There's been no discourse about that, whether that's how everybody felt they wanted to address this. It's been imposed. Um, and as you say, for, for the global good or you know, global health good. Um, anyway, amazing. Sarah, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, we're really privileged to have had your contribution today. Thank you. And I hope you're feeling better soon, Sarah. So we're going to accept if you need to video off or go and start your day. Go, you deserve a coffee. <laughs> I absolutely would welcome any interaction from anybody who's here today, either through ANU, where I do do some teaching, as you're aware, or through the University of Cambridge, where I'm currently based as a researcher, working on some of these issues. So I welcome it. And I just want to thank both you and the Menzies um, Cyber Law Series being set up by the Foundation as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. Have a lovely day. You've earned it. Good work. Thank you, Sarah. Bye. Okay, so the next piece we're going to have is pre-recorded and luckily the College of Law is now going to run that recording. You may notice that from time to time there is a little bit of a lag. The audio is fine on this recording, but there's a bit of a lag with some of the video and my visual delivery and then the audio. I would love to say that that's a party trick. It's not. It was just I had a bit of a lag with my Wi-Fi here at home when I was interviewing Dr. William Boothby. Um, now, Bill Boothby does actually teach in a number of courses here at ANU, including cyber warfare and cyber law. Um, 
He is a retired Air Commodore. He served for 30 years in the Royal Air Force Legal Branch, retiring as a Deputy Director of Legal Services in July 2011. So that's in the United Kingdom. In 2009, he took a doctorate at the Europa Universitat Viadrina in Frankfurt in Germany, and he published Weapons and the Law of Armed Conflict. This is a definitive work. And that is now published through Oxford University Press. It's in its second edition. And he's also published a book called The Law of Targeting. And that's also with the same publisher. He's been a member of a group of experts that addressed direct participation in hostilities and that produced the HPCR Manual of the Law of Air and Missile Warfare, the 2013 Talon Manual on the Law of Cyber Warfare and a manual on peace operations. And I note that Bill is actually one of the founding members of the group who decided that the Talon Manual needed to happen. His third book, Addressing Conflict Law, was published in 2014. In March 2018, he co-authored with and had published with Cambridge University Press a detailed commentary on the US Department of Defense Law's War Manual. He's got an edited volume on new technologies and the law in war and peace, and he's got a current book on nuclear weapons law. He teaches at the Australian National University, at the University of Southern Denmark, and at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. So, hoping that the recording is ready to go, I will hand over. What is cyber warfare? Um, I would say that um, you can give the term a fairly narrow meaning. And um, I think that you would do that by uh, focusing on the notion of warfare or uh, in more modern parlance, uh, armed conflict where the law is concerned, international law is concerned, and think in terms of international and non-international armed conflicts and say to yourself that this idea of cyber warfare is all about using cyber techniques in order to um, pursue an armed conflict. I suppose theoretically you could uh, consider the idea of a, a, an armed conflict conducted only using cyber techniques, but I think the more realistic approach is one that recognizes that there are likely to be more, uh, if I can call it that, conventional um, hostilities, which are in some way assisted or furthered by the use of cyber technologies. But that tends to raise the question, well, what is cyber? Mm. And I can only give you my own take on that and talk to five so-called experts and you'll get 19 different opinions. But um, as I see it, cyber is all about the use of one computer to interact in some way, not necessarily an injurious way, but in some way mm. with another computer. And so therefore the idea of cyber warfare becomes the idea of uh, engaging in um, hostilities, if you like, associated with an armed conflict using one computer in some way to interact with another computer in order to have an effect. And mm. then as a footnote, I would throw in the idea that of course we in the West, as it were, use in the political West, use um, notions of cyber. Whereas if you were talking to uh, Chinese or uh, Russian experts, they would prefer uh, to use the notion of information and communication technologies. Uh, because they tend to interpret uh, the use of computer technologies within that prism. And, and can this conflict um, and, and I guess aggression be manifested with computers attacking, let's say, the functionality of a computer, as well as a computer controlling something that is physically going to replace the human actor as we would traditionally understand it in armed conflict? 
Uh, taking the former, yes, um, you would um, potentially be using a computer to hack into a control system, say, of an... Oh, gosh, sorry, forgive me. <laughs> Put it away. Um, to use one computer to hack into a control system of, um, mm. of a facility, for instance, with a view to switching off the power grid or with a view to uh, creating a power surge, with a view to um, uh, changing the uh, operation of the air traffic control system, for instance, or, 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 or any uh, mm. piece of critical national infrastructure or whatever it might be. So yes, you can imagine that. Um, but um, what you can also uh, think in terms of is um, the idea of cyber as part of a broad spectrum of technological advance in which um, different technologies um, move forward at the same time and in which, uh, for instance, artificial intelligence um, and um, aut aut autonomous capabilities uh, founded on uh, types of artificial intelligence um, form part of the mix. And so you can, you can look at it in that context. And certainly as technology is going to be advancing in the future, you're going to be getting to the point of um, at what point are we talking about a machine? At what point are we talking about a human being? And what is the relationship here? And this isn't just future science. It's not just science fiction. We are we're in this now, aren't we? This is the nature of modern conflict. Is that correct? Um, I would I would say that it is somewhat futuristic. Mm -hmm. um, the whole notion of lethal autonomous weapon systems being considered by uh, the uh, international group of experts based in Geneva under the auspices of the Conventional Weapons Convention. Um, in other words, it's become mainstream. Yeah. And, um, and, and to that extent, it's the here and now. But the question is, what is the relationship between the discussion that's going on on the one hand and the actual level of development of the technology mm. and its level of application? And that then feeds you back into all sorts of questions. And we could be talking for hours and hours and hours about this. Um, such as, um, at what point in the technology are you referring to the sort of autonomy, if you like, and we're getting off cyber really onto autonomy now. Are you, sure. um, are you referring to the kind of autonomy that is sort of causing concern? Because mm. you have the Israelis, for instance, using their Iron Dome system um, autonomously to engage inbound mortars, rockets, and so on, um, typically, say, being fired from uh, Gaza uh, into Israel. Now, um, this uh, technology is obviously engaging what any international lawyer would recognize as being um, a lawful target, if you like, in the sense that it's it's a weapon system that's being fired in. Mm. So uh, what you what you then have is the question, um, uh, is, is there a legal problem with that sort of technology? Answer, probably no, because a human is making the decision whether to switch on the system. Um, and indeed, a decision has been made in advance of time as to whether the um, the use of that sort of system on that particular in that particular context is going to be acceptable. Um, contrast um, a platform that goes out looking for its own targets and yeah. autonomously makes decisions mm. as to what is to be attacked and what is not to be attacked when the attack is to take place, um, and so on and so forth. All of that, and that's where I think the controversies exist, and it's where. Um, the difficulty that uh, we have is uh, producing the sort of technology that is capable of making the evaluative decisions that are necessary in order to apply core 
uh, rules and principles of international law, such as the uh, rule of proportionality in targeting law, such as, yeah. you know, distinguishing between um, lawful targets and targets that should be protected, objects that should and they be are, protected. And they are questions. The, the principle of proportionality and the pr principle of distinction are constantly raised in the discussion about killer robots. But I guess what you're saying is there are different levels of autonomy that could arise. And sometimes it could be defensive, sometimes it's offensive. And I guess, I guess what the community then ends up querying is, does this make it more dangerous than what we would have understood to be the traditional type of, I guess, armed conflict, as opposed to just any kind of conflict, that we would have contemplated before, say, 15 years ago, when you were raising this? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, mm. I mean, my, my answer is both, <laughs> which is yeah. a nice way of staying on the fence. Um, there is no doubt that there, is some, there are some kinds of cyber activity um, which may give rise to fewer casualties, may give mm. rise to no casualties. Uh, but equally, there are some cyber events uh, that may lead to mass, mass casualties. Um, yeah. You know, you can imagine, for instance, if you're switching off um, a power um, distribution mm. network in an environment where temperatures routinely go to 50 degrees Celsius and above, um, then yeah. you are potentially causing mass casualties. Um, I think the notion of danger inherent in the word dangerous, um, uh, you could apply to the question of whether um, the use of this technology is a risk factor in terms of increasing the incidence of conflict as such. And that's where um, its uh, potential application in the hybrid context, hybrid warfare context, becomes relevant in the sense that you can use um, or it is possible to use cyber techniques at the margins between armed conflict and something less. It's possible mm. to use um, cyber techniques um, in order to mask um, that a particular state is involved at all, um, in order to um, uh, create a situation in which uh, it becomes very difficult uh, to determine who exactly my enemy is um, and how they're doing what they're doing. Um, spoof is yeah. a classic example of what I'm hinting at. Um, and, what, what, is and so spoofing, there Bill? Is, what is spoofing? Sorry? Is well, spoofing? You, are, you, you are engaging in an activity uh, in the cyber domain where you are uh, you're actually the actor, but you're making it appear that some other state or some other institution mm -hmm. or some other uh, body or, or indeed individual uh, is actually uh, undertaking that activity. Yeah. So there is the potential for deception, which I've always seen as being a core element in cyber, if you like, toolkit. Um, and thus, and thus there is the potential for miscalculation and misunderstanding and indeed mm. potential for overreaction. And yeah. anything that has that about it uh, has an element of danger associated with it. Mm. Um, one wonders whether, for instance, if you were to have a situation where one state is massing its troops on the border of another state and therefore acting overtly, whether that activity creates the opportunity for diplomacy to address a situation where acting behind the cyber curtain, as it were, makes it that much more difficult to, um, as it were, respond in, um, in a suitably measured way, simply because of the limitations on what you know about what the enemy is actually up to. And, and one of the questions I've often wondered, Bill, is at that point, I wonder when we stop being able to reference legacy language, legacy laws, all of those pre-cyber 
instruments and institutions, including the language we use, that was so helpful and descriptive, I wonder when it becomes quite outmoded and we find ourselves in a brand new domain in relation to the entire institution of this kind of conflict. I don't think we do. I don't think, okay. I don't think we go there. I don't, I don't think that would That's be the interesting. case. Yeah. And I don't think it would be the case because all that is happening is that the spectrum of kinds of conflict is expanding, is yeah. broadening. Yeah. But what isn't happening is that the old style of conflict is in some way being abolished because mm. it isn't. And therefore, um, what one needs is language and an approach that is capable of uh, application in that increasing spectrum. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but it's always going to be grounded in conventional warfare. And do you think a hundred years from now that we will be in that world where, where it will be actually really important to have been on top of that? Or is that too soon? Where does that, where does, what does a hundred years from now look like, Bill, to, to wrap up? I have no idea. <laughs> um, I used to... I used to, while I was still in the Air Force, um, I one of my appointments was on the legal team at, in fact, I set it up, at the, what is now the Development uh, Concepts um, Centre, what, what in those days was the Joint mm. Doctrine and Concepts Centre in Shrevenham. And one of our tasks was to prepare periodically the strategic trends um, documentation, which actually is available on, on, online, on the internet. You can Google it. And this, uh, the current edition of Strategic Trends looks out to 2040. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, looking out 100 years is, uh, in my view, pretty much looking into the imponderable. Yeah. Um, I do have, however, some thoughts. Um, I don't see competition between states or whatever then is the equivalent of states if the Westphalian system has fallen apart. I don't see that competition diminishing. I see competition for resources, for access to water, mm. for access yeah. to land, access to food access to the key essentials increase. Vaccines, Bill. Hmm? Yeah. Vaccines. I think so. mm. Well, I was, I, I, that was going to be my closing thought. It's this, that um, do, do we resolve the world's issues by means of conflict where diplomacy has failed? Or do we try to develop um, a mindset towards uh, cooperation mm. at the international level. Now, as I look at the world, this is, again, just my own personal view. As I look at the world, I see the evolution of th three main geostrategic groups centered on the United States, on Russia, and on China. Now, mm -hmm whether that will be the way that uh, the youngest viewers of this interview uh, will look back on the world in their old age and whether they'll say, I was right, or whether they will oh. say, no, you got it completely wrong. It all turned out totally differently. Well, I'm not here, to, I, I'm, not, I'm not to know, am I? Um, mm. All I can say is that, um, I, I detect at the moment um, this uh, grouping uh, process, which makes it increasingly difficult to achieve any sort of um, global consensus on yeah. the sort of key issues that we've been discussing. 
witness the fact that uh, treaties on relatively mundane issues like the law relating to armed conflict um, just aren't, uh, as a whole, just aren't emerging these days. Now, yeah. if, if that continues, that's, I think, a rather dangerous um, uh, approach. I would obviously prefer, and I think most of us in the West would prefer, um, a general acceptance of rules-based order for the world um, in which uh, states can get together and can discuss and reach a consensus apropos things like cyber autonomy, um, mm. artificial intelligence, artificial brain technologies, and all the other things that are out there that we haven't been talking about. Mm. Um, now, maybe I'm wrong, uh, maybe a more optimistic approach is more accurate, in which case, three cheers from me. Um, but um, I just have a feeling that at the moment, where we don't seem to be going in the right direction, but who knows, with the new administration in the United States, um, may a climate of respect amongst the three main powers in the world can be achieved. And if that mm. can be achieved, then I would imagine that certainly the relatively more immediate future is that much more rosy. Um, 100 years out, I find completely imponderable, I must admit. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Bill Boothie, what a legend. <laughs> Um, the amazing thing about Bill is that he can take everything we know about different levels of autonomy and then warfare, which could be under the sea, on the sea, on the land, in the air, in space or cyberspace, and just succinctly draw it all together with some core principles. He's amazing. Um, anyway, I'm sorry he wasn't able to be with us live, but he's actually teaching as we speak. Um, it's morning in England and he is right now in front of a classroom, probably talking about the sort of things he discussed with me last Thursday when we recorded that interview. Okay, so third on the agenda, we have uh, Dr. Bateman. Will leads the multi-jurisdictional projects on the legal regulation of public and private finance with a special focus on central banking, sovereign debt markets, national budget formulation, and sustainable investing. His recent engagement with central banks and financial regulators include the Federal Reserve Bank of New York on legal aspects of central bank money creation and Bank of England on quantitative easing, reserve creation, and digital currency. Dr. Bateman also leads research projects on the regulation of artificial intelligence or AI and is currently spearheading a major project on the formulation of model legal frameworks to govern artificial intelligence in the public sector. He also collaborates with computer science experts in designing ethical and lawful algorithmic decision-making systems. His law tech collaboration partners include Mindaroo Foundation, um, that's in relation to global philanthropic organizational interests, and the Gradient Institute with Ethical AI Research and Humanizing Machine Intelligence, which is an ANU Grand Challenge project, and a, um, I think a term to look out for. I think humanizing machine intelligence is going to become something everyone's going to talk about, and it started here at ANU with Dr. Will. Um, Will, over to you. Thank you so much, Pip. One thing that I must add very quickly uh, that Dr. Bateman occasionally does is have to fend off his cat, Guido, who will try and attack the laptop screen. So if that happens, I'm not having a seizure. I'm just dealing with um, a slightly aggressive rescue demanding my attention. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Pip, for the introduction. And thank you for organising this marvellous event. Thank you to uh, the co-presenters, um, Sarah, who was here with us, and Bill, who was uh, here via um, somewhat deferred video link, and to Liz uh, from the Menzies Foundation for uh, supporting this program. And this is a tremendously important program um, focused on future, um, future forecasting, the world of lawyers, technology, um, and ultimately social development, with a focus on um, leadership. 
Leadership requires forecasting. It requires gazing into the future. And this is a hard activity for lawyers who are accustomed to look backwards into precedents and to the, into the dramas of people's lives that end in court cases. Lawyers occasionally also look to the future in writing legislation and drafting contracts, but those tend not to be the most glamorous sides of legal practice and maybe not parts of legal practice that we emphasize sufficiently in uh, law schools. I'm lucky enough to be an academic lawyer with lots of research support to do nothing but think about the future. At the ANU Law School, and as part of the ANU's Humanizing Machine Intelligence multidisciplinary project, I consider the big questions in this field. What will the law look like when we shift legal decision making wholly to algorithmic decision systems? Who wins and who loses when lawyers are replaced by software engineers? And what values of the legal past can we carry forward into what appears to be quite a brave new world of automated law? That world of automated law already exists in a somewhat embryonic form. Smart contracts and automated serv public service delivery systems are examples of legal processes and legal ideas being executed wholly through mechanistic uh, algorithmic decision systems. They can seem banal, and in one sense they are, but they're part of a big, bold future. Uh, for both legal practice and social organization, which includes automated legal advice or robo lawyers and automated legal decision making, think robo judges. Having met quite a few judges, I think turning some of them into robots might be um, slightly redundant. Um, that future is quite far down the track, but we need to build intellectual resources to cope with that change when it arrives. And my talk today is going to cover framework issues that confront lawyers, legal scholars, politicians and citizens as we try to make sense of algorithmic decision making and legal environments and the use of AI to act in legally regulated domains. I will now attempt to exercise my own technical capacity by sharing my screen and my PowerPoint slide. If it doesn't occur instantaneously, it's the computer, it's not me, obviously. So please just bear with me for one second. Share screen. And I'm just unmuting Will so I can tell you if I can see it nicely, which I can. Marvellous. No, yes, so go yes, for it. Yes, very, very good. Okay. Um, just bear with me for two seconds. Fabulous. Uh, I'll start my talk uh, very concretely. Um, and I'm going to wrap all the complex ideas which I presented very quickly in my um, introduction into the slightly retro title of automatic law. Um, I'm constantly criticized for this idea. People say it reminds them of, you know, the cybermatic or the vacuummatic, all these kinds of like late 70s, early 80s words to describe uh, you know, transistor radios and vacuum cleaners. But I think it's actually quite a, an apt title. And so I'm sticking with it. I'll start my talk very con con concretely and I'll show how the future of automated legal rules and legal processes is very much upon us. I'll then step back and think about the higher order theoretical clash between the model of the rule of law, which is in the brains of most lawyers, and the idea of what law should do in society and what the rule of law should achieve, which is in the minds of systems designers, cybernetics enthusiasts and the people who buy and sell algorithms which are deployed in legal contexts. I'll conclude by posing some questions and tentative answers about what should be done in a world in which laws are subject to the mechanistic logic of algorithms, hopefully giving us plenty of grist for the mill in discussions. But let's begin by examining some concrete examples of automatic law. The first slide is a statute passed by the Commonwealth Parliament in 2001, which authorizes automatic decision making in public welfare administration. This is the statutory provision which underlay the use of the RoboDebt algorithm, which has become almost worryingly famous in this country. You'll see some important features of it. The most important feature is that it permits a, the Secretary of the Department 
that is administering the social security legislation to delegate decision-making authority to a computer program. This is another slide. This is another example of an automated uh, law provision. This provision underlies uh, all, visa all visa administration at points of entry in Australia. Every time you go through a, a smart gate to enter the country or return to the country and you put your passport in, it spits a little ticket out. And a decision has been made under the Migration Act pursuant to an algorithm which is authorised to do so under this piece of legislation. Again, the important features to notice about this is that it very explicitly and very concretely confers authority on a public official to delegate legal decision-making power to an algorithm, to a computer system. And both of these uh, authorities, these legislative authorities, have been very widely taken up by the Commonwealth Government, which is famous worldwide as being what's called an early adopter of algorithmic decision-making services. These are two examples of principles which the Australian Government's Administrative Research Council set out in 2004, which were designed to prevent complex legal judgments from being translated into binary form and then executed through algorithmic processes. Principle one, expert systems that make a decision would generally be suitable only for decisions involving non-discretionary elements. Principle two, expert systems should not automate the exercise of discretion. Now, once there could have been debate about whether the legislation I showed you a few moments ago flouted those principles. People weren't sure, uh, is the Commonwealth Government deploying algorithms which exercise very complicated discretionary decision-making processes, or are they just deploying it in very simple decision tree contexts? You know, this piece of paper must be sent to this address on this day. No discretion, no complexity. Once upon a time, we could have an argument about that, but we no longer can. After RoboDebt, the answer is painfully clear. Australian legislation authorises the use of algorithmic decision systems in complex and highly discretionary environments, which expose government officials and private citizens to enormous levels of legal risk and other types of economic and personal harm. So the obvious next question is why have we begun deploying these computers to exercise complex legal powers? Now, this is perhaps echoing some of Bill's sentiment, but whatever tech utopia we hear about from venture capitalists, decisions about technology policy are informed by much more mundane considerations, as historians of technology have long recognised. The reason we employ automated algorithmic decision systems are not complex. We employ them because they're cheap or cheaper than humans, and they're predictable, unlike humans. And this is so because non-technical factors almost always take precedence in technology policy decisions over technical factors. And technology is an immensely human activity. It's very difficult to take the drive to cost less, earn more, be able to cost risk, predict the way your employees will behave away from all of the glitter and the sound and the noise around algorithms and the algorithmic future. So we know that algorithmic legal decision making is authorised by legislation. And I should as well, I should interpolate authorised all over the world by legislation in this way. So Australia was the, one of the first countries in the world to introduce this kind of legislation, but it's popping up all over the place now. And we also know why people like algorithmic decision making. We like it because it's cheap and it's predictable. But what exactly is algorithmic decision making? What exactly is automated law? Now, because I'm a lawyer in a Zoom room, hopefully full of lawyers, on a call with other lawyers, I'll give a definition because lawyers love definitions. Automation comes from a Greek word, automatos, which means something that acts of itself. And I think we can only speak sensibly about automatic law or algorithmic law when the process of legal decision making is automated, when it occurs without human intervention. Now, that would include many different types of technologies. You can achieve automation in the law using symbolic AI. You can achieve it using connectionist AI, which is 
also another way to describe machine learning technologies. You can achieve it using manual processes where individual people are just required to pick a paper up from one tray and put it inside another tray. We're slightly beyond that now, but punch cards were somewhere between that process and the RoboDebt algorithm. It is clear that this idea of automated law, as I've given it a potted definition, would include RoboDebt type of government service delivery algorithms. And it would also, I hope, uh, we can discuss this more with my, with my esteemed colleague, Pip Bryan, who is a global authority on smart contracts. It would also include many smart contracts. Why would it include both of those two things? Because you preset the circumstances and the conditions and the logic under which decisions will be made, whether they're decisions to administer contracts or whether they're decisions to administer public welfare legislation. And then you walk away from the system and it occurs on its own. It makes decisions of itself. Again, attractive because you don't have to keep paying it. You have to pay for electricity, but you don't have to keep, you don't have to pay a pension. You don't have to pay it annual leave. It just does it. And you can know exactly what it's going to do. Sometimes it will do things which you wish it didn't do, but it will almost always do exactly what you tell it to do. Now that we have that basic definition under our belt, I'm going to talk relatively briefly about two things connected to the idea of automatic law. The first is its short life history. And the second is why all lawyers, rather than just technologists, again, or venture capitalists, or Bitcoin bros, as they're now, as they're now also called, should care about automatic law. So let us start with the past. Let us start with history. In 1968, Lon Fuller, Professor Lon Fuller, a giant in the analytical jurisprudential world, introduced English speaking lawyers to this significant insight. The successful functioning of a legal system depends upon repeated acts of human judgment at every level of the system. He described human judgment as the ineluctable necessity of law. And then he gave his title, he gave the title of that insight, the human element in law. And he closed this brief meditation in a book which I exhort you all to read called The Anatomy of Law by unqualifiedly stating that the human element in law cannot be built into a computer. Now, Fuller's insight received almost no attention in the 1960s and has remained mostly in obscurity ever since. But two things matter about his brief meditation on computerized law. The first is his view that, is that his view captures the core predicate upon which most modern legal thought is premised. That law has no independent existence, existence independent of the very human processes of textual and social interpretation. And it is upon that predicate that law doesn't exist as an independent thing. It exists as something we all do together. We lawyers build our model of legal reality. Now that legal reality entails a strong distinction between two things, the written words of a law and the modes of interpretation and action employed to operationalize those words in the world. Now, one of my contentious generalizations tonight, because this is supposed to be a fun call and it's not going to be any fun if we hedge everything we say with a thousand different um, academic qualifications, is that almost all legal and juristic thought is concerned with working out the proper relationship between those two things, the written words of a law and the modes of interpretation and action that we use to operationalize those words. Now, if you're a bit of a geek, um, a legal geek anyway, you'll see a little bit of what I'm talking about in all the major legal theoretic and philosophical debates of the last hundred years. Hart's core and penumbra, core, words, penumbra, interpretation, action. Dworkin's chain novel, um, fit, you've got to work out a way to fit the words into their ordinary grammatical meaning in the text, and then you interpret them in this important sense within a, within a social practice which stretches back through time. Now, those, those core jurisprudential, those core theoretical debates are concerned with explaining the relationship between law and morality under two intellectual constraints. The first is that the words of a law only begin the process of legal thought. 
And the second core intellectual constraint, which frames all of our understandings, theoretical understandings about law, is that humans end the process of legal interpretation and legal meaning by using moral choice and moral action. Very difficult to do that if you remove humans entirely from the process. That core distinction between written words and the interpretation and the enactment of that interpretation of those words also holds at the level of modern doctrinal legal thought and practice. And you know this because the common law has become far more concerned with generating rules about the interpretation and methodology of legal texts, contracts, trusts, documents, uh, legislation, than it has about independently generating rules about human conduct. So this is this is just a this is a, a an arm a piece of armchair anecdata about the way that judges all over the world behave. They spend a lot less time dreaming up new rules for people, and they spend a lot more time thinking about how to interpret things. And it's because they accept that the words legal words are set, and most of their job as a lawyer, in fact, almost all of it, is interpretation and enactment of interpretation. Now, one thing that unites those disparate matters of philosophy, theory, and practice is that each presupposes that the law is not capable of autonomous behavior. A legal rule is not a boat, which once you push it out, will autocorrect its course. Human hands are required to steer the boat to its landing. Now, that's my model or my remodeling of Fuller's meditation. And it's deliberately florid because Fuller's idea of law was very romantic. And the romanticism of that idea of law about human hands steering the written words to its destination conceals quite a, quite a, quite a serious contradiction. The rule of law literature tells us that a core value of law, that it is free from the capricious judgments of other people. We obtain freedom through law by being permitted to plan our lives according to a set of rules which are predictable and clear. That is where freedom resides, so it goes. But if the law requires people to guide it, then it's not just, then it's just other people, not the law which controls our lives. And if that is true, then a core value of law appears illusory in a very important way. Now, Fuller had the intellectual honesty to recognize that dilemma, and he had a set of theoretical um, ways around it, what he called his eight pillars, his inner morality of law, that law must be certain, predictable, official action must conform to it, it must be non-retrospective, um, it, it must be clear, it must operate equally. Now, uh, those rules were designed to preserve a distinction between the rule of law and the rule by other people. And whatever their theoretical value, those uh, core ideas about what law should be, the standards of legal excellence articulated by Fuller, are observed almost invariably in the breach at the level of legal practice, which tends to infuriate people. Now, the second thing that matters about Fuller's idea, this human element in law idea, is that it was articulated around the time that a very different idea of law was being gestated in the Northwest United, in, in the Northwest and the North, Northeast United States under the influence of cybernetics and systems theory. Now that idea of law, the cybernetic idea of law, readily accepted Fuller's dilemma. The dilemma being that if, if law is just what people do, then there is no such thing as freedom under law but it contested its core premise that the law could never be built into a computer. And it navigates around the problem of rule by other people by removing other people from the law applying process altogether. And the idea is that any gap between the letter of the law, which is democratically made, and the application of that law could be removed by automation of that law. Now, this is quite a difficult concept, but it's a concept which sits behind most of the intellectual benefits and the intellectual arguments in favor of algorithmic processes being rolled out in private and public relationships. It doesn't automatically come into being. You need to follow a certain number of steps to get from what we understand to be the law to this cybernetic idea of the law. And the first step 
is to establish that human social institutions can be modeled on a systematically rational basis in a broadly mechanistic way, just like electricity moving around a motherboard of a computer, or just like physical processes moving in accordance with the basic rules of physics. The second step is to apply that systematically rational model to the law as simply another social institution. The third step is for a variety of public policy makers and private citizens, preferably of the high net worth variety, to accept that law and public administration could be made systematically rational through the use of machines. Now, each of those steps contains several dissertations for future PhD researchers, and I hope that we have some of them on the call with us this evening. But even at a high level, it's impossible not to simply see them as a repetition or a superimposition of cybernetics and systems theory onto the basic rule of law dilemmas that we face. What is cybernetics and what is systems theory? Also several dissertations in those core ideas. But each can be described as a general science of organized complexity. And each has taken a very firm root in the social sciences. The strongest influence of cybernetics and systems theory in the discipline of law can be seen in the work of legal regulation theorists, whose own work is really just a discrete application of general systems theory to law. And we have a number of those um, scholars working at the ANU. What guides them is an idea of the general science of organized complexity, core emphasis on organization, which is wholly distinct from the artificial reason, to quote a 17th century jurist, of the common law. That cybernetics approach seeks to make the relationship between law creation and law application as mechanical as possible by relying on a number of core ideas which may or may not be true about the way that human language operates or may or may not be true about the way that we can understand human behavior through statistical correlations inside large data sets. Symbolic AI, human language, connections, connectionist AI or machine learning. The cybernetics of the, the aim of the cybernetic movement is to aim to find a way to ensure that people who are governed by law select as directly as possible the rules which govern them. I apologize, I'm, I'm struggling with my technology. That aim is to be achieved by very direct implementation of democratic choice without any role for intermediated law speakers, the people who would now consider to be judges or legal experts, robo lawyers, robo judges replace the current wigged and pinstripe versions. Now to see how or why anyone would want this position or want this to occur, it's helpful to reflect on the fact that early 20th century social reformers saw the law as spoken by judges to be an obstacle to democracy. People who pushed for center left ideas and often center right ideas about the welfare state and also about equality in society, gender equality, racial equality, saw judges as problems, not as solutions. We have a slightly different view to that now. And they saw them as problems because judges were always twisting the words of statutes. And you can see that very clearly in a lot of the doctrine around tax legislation, but you can also see it in the doctrine around family rights and particularly women's rights inside marriages and the doctrine around work, workplace rights, particularly work, uh, legal rights or legal controversies concerning discrimination on race, racial grounds. Now, under the automatic or cybernetic law paradigm, you write a law and it becomes law in that written form. It doesn't require human hands to steer it, and so human hands can't distort it. Now, I posit that such an ethos must underlie the use of algorithms to make decisions under social security and immigration statutes, along with the usual cost saving and efficiency justifications. I've got, I've got a warning that I'm about to go over time. And all I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ask for a little bit more time because some of my other presenters went a little bit over time too. So if, if, as long as the Zoom room doesn't stop instantly, Dr. Ryan, I'm gonna ask for an extra five minutes. Go with it because it is being recorded and we've got just 90% of everybody who started is still here. Marvelous. So we're, I'm, Marvelous. And I'm still with you, I'm loving it. If people are screaming for me to stop, there is, you know, there's, 
there must be a way to do it with the raised hand function or something. But I could interpret that being a dodgy lawyer as, Will, this is great, please keep going. Um, no, I'm getting, I'm getting chat saying it's fantastic. So jolly good. A slightly different ethos applies to the users of smart contracts. And people who seek to automate through smart contracts are not necessarily pursuing this higher, this higher good. They're looking to eradicate opportunity costs and regulatory risk by mapping out in exquisite detail the way that contractual relationships should pan out. In both contexts, however, cybernetic ideas about the way that human society works drive the desire to do away with the fuzziness of law in a flurry of predictable binary rules. Now, being aware of my limited time, I'm gonna say, why should lawyers care about any of this stuff? So to kickstart conversation, I'll give two reasons. The first reason is selfish. If we ignore the reasons why automatic law is attractive, i.e. it takes away these annoying people who are always twisting the words of the law from the, the process of legal decision making, then a lot of legal work risks becoming seriously irrelevant. The techniques of doctrinal legal scholarship and doctrinal legal practice in law firms depend on preferring Lon Fuller's idea that legal judgment can never be built into a computer to the cybernetic idea that actually we can implement very rational, predictable, binary rules to govern ordinary people's behavior through, through law. Now, if you're a doctrinal scholar, what do you say about the automatic decision-making legislation I displayed at the outset? They're not marginal cases. Migration law and social security law are some of the, high, most, are the highest volume government decision-making domains, and they're certainly some of the most politicized. So the implementation or the rollout of algorithms in those contexts to exercise statutory power is certainly not marginal. But as someone who interacts with a lot of doctrinal legal scholars and was one, one myself before I got better, I can say that there are um, there's actually not a great deal we can say doctrinally about those core statutes of the welfare state and the modern government. There's not a great deal of doctrinal legal techniques have to say about it. And that's simply because most of them were generated in a time before the fax machine. Now, lawyers like to have answers. It's how we get paid and it's how we measure our self-esteem. And there are answers to the problems that we face in this particular world that I'm envis envisaging of automatic law. Uh, but to offer them, we need to ask very difficult questions, which means engaging with the world, engaging with data, engaging with many other disciplines, not just reading the dusty law books, which I must confess a guilty pleasure to continue and to enjoy myself. Now, the second reason why lawyers should care about the content of today's discussion about automatic law, about Lon Fuller, about the cybernetics movement is slightly less selfish. And it focuses on the value of the rule of law to all humans. Now, human justice is fallible, emotive, and ripe for abuse. But it is responsive to developing social change in a fashion that automatic law may not be, which is to say that the automatic law paradigm fails almost entirely to account for changing social values and rapidly changing environmental conditions around a legal decision maker or around a person. Now, since Aristotle, there's been a recognized need to provide, quote, a correction of law where law falls short because of its universality, which expresses the basic point that the need for an exception to a legal rule can often only be appreciated once you actually start to apply the legal rule rather than at the point at which you create the legal rule. And that may be the core of what human law provides that automatic law cannot provide. In that sense, and that's because flexibility and individual, individuated justice can be seen as antithetical to the core rule of law values of legal certainty and also the core design principles of most algorithmic decision systems. If all of this is true, and you accept my very brief invocation of Aristotle, then we may need to think quite carefully about how to justify the human rule of law as preferable to law by machines and by algorithms if we are to survive meaningfully and to maintain a meaningful social organization. And with that, I'll close. 
perhaps not even needing the full five minutes. Um, thank you so much for listening. I'm very keen to hear your views in the event that we have any Q&A. Um, and thank you once again to PIP, my co-presenters, the Menzies Foundation, the ANU College of Law for hosting this marvellous event. Uh, thank you, Will. And I might note, I am a doc doctrinal lawyer. Thank you very much. Um, I'm taking something for it, but luckily it's co-prescribed with a very nice West Australian Sauvignon Blanc, which is a good thing. Um, and I once read a monograph by Aristotle on fax machines. I'll share the link with you, Will. Um, yes, now, we do have some Q&A, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap it up. I have saved the Q&A. There's two questions for you, Will. Two for Bill Boothby, one for Sarah. I'm going to send them to you. I've saved them. I'm going to get some answers back. And whoever joins me next Thursday for our uh, Menzies Cyber Masters will get the answers to those amazing questions. So thank you to our wonderful audience who've been interactive and sending lovely comments and asking great questions. Thank you, Will. Um, Liz, thank you for your lovely introduction and for everything you've done to support this. And I note, we will be back with number two. Uh, number two is on a completely different topic. We're going to be talking about the truth, the future of the truth. Um, so look out for any comms tomorrow in relation to next Thursday and also for Mendy's Cyber Series number two. But for now, that is a wrap. Thank you very much.